Good morning. My name is Bob Nichols. I'm a partner with Bracewell here in our Houston office. I'm on our webinar today with Amber Dodds, my partner. Let me tell you a little bit about us. I have practiced labor and employment law exclusively for employers, for businesses for 33 years. Amber has done the very same thing, devoted her practice to labor and employment, representing employers for 10 years. And she's been with us that entire 10 years. So I've had 10 good years having the opportunity to work with Amber. Amber and I, our labor and employment group, have a unique niche in that she and I are really the occupational safety and health lawyers in particular in our group, doing among other things. And she and I have dealt with a lot of complicated OSHA matters. Again, I for about 33 years and Amber for her entire tenure. So occupational safety is a major focus of our practice and how we spend our time. And in recent years, the difficulties caused for our safety-sensitive clients by the increase in marijuana use and the relaxation of marijuana prohibitions and the creation of employment protections in some states for marijuana users have caused complications for our clients trying to maintain a safe and healthful workplace. And we're going to talk about that topic today, how you pursue a safe workplace in an ever-changing world with respect to marijuana. If you have any questions today, you will see somewhere in the upper portion of your screen a chat box where you can type in a question. And we may not have time to address that today, but I promise Amber and I will answer every question posed afterward by calling or emailing uh, the person posing the question. This is on our nickel. Anyone who wants to leave a question will get back to you and answer it. So don't hesitate to pose one of your good questions. As for continuing education, this webinar has been approved for continuing legal education by the Texas State Bar. Uh, there's also the opportunity for continuing legal education for those of you who are members of the New York Bar. Many of our good clients on this call today have other organizations they belong to that have continuing education requirements, whether they are accounting organizations, whether they're human resource organizations, whether they're safety organizations. We're glad to give you a certificate of completion for this webinar. And our experience has been often those organizations will accept that certificate as continuing education credit for their organization. So don't hesitate to ask us for that certificate. So let's talk about a little bit more about our topic today. When you look at our cover screen, you see that our title has two key components with respect to marijuana and workplace safety. First of all, Use is becoming more pervasive in this country, and laws are becoming more permissive. And in fact, more states are creating employment protections for off-duty marijuana use. So the landscape is changing. As we'll discuss today, marijuana has still has impairing effects. It affects human skills, which are important in safety-sensitive jobs. Therefore, Our clients, particularly industrial clients, energy clients, healthcare clients, concerned with safety and well-being, are worried about a world where marijuana use is becoming increasingly ubiquitous, and they're having to deal with the potential safety effects of that increasing marijuana use. We'd like to begin with a discussion of how public views of marijuana are changing and how usage is increasing. And for that discussion, let me turn to my partner, Amber. As Bob indicated, we'd like to begin our webinar with a quick background note on the changing view of cannabis nationwide. In a Pew Research study conducted just last year, researchers found extensive support for legalized medical marijuana, with over 90% of Americans surveyed in support. Further, more than half of American respondents to that survey supported legalization of both recreational and medical marijuana. Predictions are that this support will only continue to grow, no pun intended here, as support for recreational and medical marijuana is significantly higher among the younger population. As you'll see on our slide, studies have shown that only 32% of adults aged 75 and older support recreational and medical marijuana, while the under age 30 adult population support is around 70%. As you can imagine, and as Bob mentioned, with increased support, we are also seeing increased cannabis use. 
Columbia University researchers have concluded that this increase in use results from, at least in part, legalization of marijuana. To be clear, increased use is reaching historically high rates among young people, as found by the National Institutes of Health last year. But use is not only driven by young people. With a national survey on drug use and health finding that approximately 10% of adults aged 26 and older are using marijuana on a monthly basis, a rate that has doubled from just a decade ago. I want to emphasize that this information is not just based on surveys about use, but supported by objective measures as well. Just last week, the Wall Street Journal reported that workplace drug screens with positive marijuana results have increased by 50% since 2017. Let me say that again. Drug screens with positive marijuana results have increased by 50% in just the past five years. This is not simply a problem for the young or non-working population. Increased use is seen in workplace testing as well. Another aspect of marijuana use that is changing quickly is increased use of other cannabis products, which Bob will discuss next. Thank you, Amber. A really interesting development related to cannabis products and workplace safety and employee use of cannabis products is the increasing use of other cannabis plant derivatives besides classic use of marijuana and what's called the Delta 9 THC that we traditionally associate with the high of smoking marijuana. There are some new products that are becoming more pervasive. Many of you have already heard in recent years about CBT. We'll talk about that briefly. But more interestingly, there is a new type of THC called Delta-8 that is becoming more widely used. Delta-9 THC is the traditional THC found in abundance in marijuana plants that produces the classic high for marijuana we know about. Let's, Let's cover some basics. Cannabis 101. Marijuana and hemp are both varieties of the cannabis plant. The main psychoactive substance in cannabis plants is THC. There are various varieties of THC. Two key varieties we're going to talk about primarily today are Delta-9, which is the form of THC that we, again, uh, are familiar with from marijuana and produce the high and is found in abundance in the marijuana plant. And now Delta-8. Delta-8 is different than Delta-9 in that it's less potent with regard to its psychoactive substance. It has less of an effect, but it's not like CBD. Delta-8 does have an intoxicating effect like Delta-9, but at a lesser level. Delta-8, like THC-9, can be found to some extent in both hemp and marijuana. Delta-8 has a calming and euphoric effect like Delta-9, but in a milder form. And proponents of Delta-8 claim that it has, it lacks some of the adverse side effects that some claim come with Delta-9, such things as feelings of paranoia or anxiety that some feel with smoking marijuana. The a key to understanding legality with regard to Delta-8 and Delta-9 is to understand the federal 2018 Farm Bill that legalized hemp and its derivatives. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has long been a big proponent of hemp. Why? Because hemp is grown in the, in the great state of Kentucky, and it's used for industrial purposes and fabric, rope, et cetera. And that was seen as a business opportunity. The problem is hemp is so associated with the cannabis plant, and there's been this general adverse view of it like there is with traditional marijuana because of that. In the 2018 Farm Bill, that was passed, Congress made hemp and its derivatives lawful under federal law if the plant contains less than 0.3% Delta-9 THC. And with that law, the idea was is that hemp would be used, but it would not be able to be used for psychoactive effects because of the low level of THC-9 in the hemp. Well, the very creative cannabis industry quickly found ways around this. First of all, the 2018 Farm Bill does not regulate explicitly Delta-8 THC. Again, Congress certainly didn't intend for people to be using Delta-8 THC 
for its psychoactive effects, but the law dealt with Delta-9. So proponents of cannabis turned to Delta-8 to create products in lieu of use of traditional Delta-9 products like smoking marijuana. Again, Congress clearly did not intend to legalize the use of any psychoactive cannabinoid in passing the 2018 Farm Bill. However, that failure to address Delta-8 has led a variety of creative entrepreneurs to conclude that they can lawfully sell products containing this cannabinoid, Delta-8, at least under federal law. Well, as you might imagine, a a lot of state legislatures don't see it that way and state regulators. While Delta-8 is arguably lawful under federal law, a number of states have already explicitly banned it. And you see a list of illustrative states here. In the state in which I live and work, Texas, in October of this year, the Texas Department of State Health Services placed Delta-8 on our state Schedule 1 of unlawful controlled substances. Instantly, some entrepreneurs selling Delta-8 products uh, leaped into action and filed a lawsuit in Travis County in Austin, Texas, saying that the state agency had not followed the proper notice procedure to include Delta-8 on the list of banned substances under Texas law. Bear in mind, Delta-8 is derived from hemp, not from marijuana when it, is, when it is used to create products. And you can derive Delta-8 from hemp that contains less than 0.3% Delta-9. So again, in theory, it's legal under federal and Texas law. But again, the state agency sought to ban it. And interestingly enough, a judge in Austin issued an injunction stopping the state from enforcing its ban on Delta-8. The Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court have refused to interfere, at least in the near term, with that injunction. The matter is in litigation. So my guess is someday Delta-8 will be unlawful in Texas, though it would appear with the injunction in place, these entrepreneurs can continue to sell their products in the state of Texas. Something odd about those states that have banned Delta-8 is that it includes states that allow full recreational use of marijuana, like Colorado and Washington. So in those states, you can go buy marijuana that has ample quantities of Delta-9 in it, but you can't buy the milder form of THC, Delta-8. Interestingly, let me tell you a little bit more about Delta-8. It does not appear in in abundance in hemp or marijuana. So chemical solvents are used to extract Delta-8. So it's really sort of synthetically developed from the plant. Again, it's easy to extract Delta-9 from traditional marijuana. So that's another distinction between these two substances. So what, what, is all the, what does Delta-8 mean for employers? Employers need to be clear with their employees that on-the-job impairment use or possession of THC, any THC product is prohibited regardless of the variety of THC. You are not going to get into a practice of distinguishing between employee intoxication from THC, whether, depending on whether it's Delta-8 or Delta-9. Your employees have to understand any use of THC that leads to, certainly that leads to on-the-job impairment use or possession is contrary to company policy. To the extent the employer engages in marijuana testing of applicants or employees your organization should be clear that any positive test for THC will be treated as a positive test in your drug testing program. And you're not going to accept excuses that, well, I was using Delta-8 and, well, maybe it's not unlawful in this state and maybe it's not unlawful under federal law, so you shouldn't punish me. You're going to treat a positive test under your drug testing program for THC as a positive test. And because of the very similar molecular structure of Delta-8 and Delta-9, Delta-8 use can produce a positive result on drug urinalysis, just like Delta-9. By the way, you may ask, how do people consume Delta-8? Well, like with Delta-9, there are alternatives to, to smoking. There are edibles, there are vaping oils, and there are what are called tinctures, which is, is a way of extracting liquid extracts of Delta-8 or Delta-9 from the cannabis plant, and then that liquid is consumed orally. So these very creative entrepreneurs have found a variety of of, of means of delivering the THC to their customers. Oils that are used through vaping, smoking, edibles such as gummies, 
And again, liquid extracts, tinctures. Bear in mind when we talk about employees using these THC substances and you testing, as we're going to discuss today, your ability to test in some jurisdictions has been limited. And your ability to hold a positive test against an employee solely based upon that test has been limited in other states. By the way, a couple of closing points about these varieties of THC. There's actually something called Delta 10 THC, which is another uh, another variety of THC that produces a mild effect. And it may be the next big fad, and it may be the next concern that state legislatures need to chase in terms of making various forms of THC unlawful. Also, by the way, these very creative uh, proponents of the use of THC have also found ways to include THC-9, the classic form of THC, in products like gummies that are derived from hemp and are below the 0.3 cutoff under the farm bill. And therefore, they're included in like gummies and employees or individuals still obtain the high desired, but by just consuming more of the gummies. So we have all of these issues about uh, the way entrepreneurs are trying to find ways about prohibitions on various types of THC. That turns us to a topic we've been dealing with for a longer period of time as employers, which is CBD use. Cannabis oil, CBD, is another cannabinoid. Cannabinoid means something derived, a constituent part of the cannabis plant, whether it be the marijuana plant or the hemp plant. As many of you know, CBD, unlike THC, is generally non-intoxicating. It doesn't, if in appropriate levels, it does not produce a high. CBD products are derived from hemp, and the legitimate makers of those products make sure they're below 3% THC level provided for under the 2018 Farm Bill. Therefore, they have lawful products under federal law. And in many states, products below that 3% level derived from hemp are lawful, including in Texas. And this is, in my view and in Amber's view, less of a concern for you legitimate CBD products because what you're worried about with THC is the intoxicating effect. And legitimate CBD is generally non-intoxicating. And with all of the issues you have on your plate, I would not spend a lot of time worrying about employees using CBD products, whether they be lotions or oils or pills, if they're legitimate CBD products. Because again, CBD use has become so widespread, you can buy those products in chain drug stores. And again, legitimate CBD products are non-intoxicating. You shouldn't worry about trying to eradicate CBD use among your employees. And also, you're going to have legal fights on your hands if you try to. Bear in mind, however, in a drug testing program that includes marijuana, if an employee ever claims that a positive marijuana result stems from CBD use, you can't have a drug testing program for marijuana and accept that excuse. Your answer has to be, you tested positive for THC and you face the consequences for that. CBD in its appropriate fashion below 0.3% THC, generally speaking, should not produce a positive test. The, one of the problems is CBD products are coming from all kinds of sources, some of them not reputable, and some CBD products may in fact be over that 0.3% threshold and therefore more likely to cause a positive marijuana test. Now, let me turn things back to Amber to talk to you about why you have to care about THC use as an employer. And that is the very real impairing effects of these substances. As Bob discussed, marijuana and many of the cannabis related products he walked through can have intoxicating and psychoactive effects. Notably for our discussion today, these effects can significantly impair key functions resulting in accidents. For example, Boston University researchers recently reported that the percentage of car crash fatalities involving cannabis has doubled between the year 2000 and 2018. Similarly, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety found that crash rates spiked in several states following the legalization and retail sales of recreational marijuana. These crash rates are supported by studies on the specific effects of marijuana on users. The effects include, as reported by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, 
impairment of coordination, distorted perception, potential memory loss, and difficulty problem solving. The National Safety Council adds that marijuana can impair depth perception, reaction time, and motor skills, as well as create sensory distortions. The council then reiterated that the effects of marijuana use can be severe, even deadly, for workers who operate heavy machinery or vehicles. Having discussed to this point increased use and the potential impacts of that use, I want to transition to Bob to discuss changes in the law. As many of you realize from the newspaper and the news, the legal landscape on a state-by-state basis with regard to marijuana in this country has changed dramatically in recent years, particularly in the last 15 years. There's only 12 states left that do not permit some use of true medical marijuana. And you see those 12 states, those 12 holdouts right here. You will note that some of those states, like Texas, do allow not true medical marijuana, but some low THC medicinal products. But those are not classic marijuana. They don't have the intoxicating effect. And bear in mind, many proponents of marijuana would argue you can't have true effective medical marijuana that doesn't have the intoxicating effect because the intoxicating effect is the medical benefit in many instances, purported medical benefit for the use of the marijuana, like with PTSD, depression, pain associated with chemotherapy. If you eliminate the intoxicating effect, you largely eliminate the proposed benefit of medical marijuana. So those low THC products, very low THC products for medical purposes, like those allowed in Texas, are in no sense true medical marijuana. These are the 12 holdout states. Take a look at them because this list will shrink. It'll shrink next year. It'll shrink the year after. We are headed towards a country where, where medical marijuana will someday be lawful everywhere. Take my state, Texas, for example. A strong, according to the University of Texas survey, a strong majority of Texans support the legalization of medical marijuana. It is our very conservative legislature that is standing in the way. And even opposition in our legislature and other conservative legislatures represented by these states on this slide is quickly diminishing. And someday medical marijuana, someday not too soon into the future, medical marijuana will be lawful in all 50 states. Bear in mind that in 2010, there were only 14 states that allowed medical marijuana use. Now, 12 years later, it's 38 plus the District of Columbia. The landscape with regard to legalization of recreational marijuana has changed dramatically among the states as well. In 2010, there were zero states that permitted recreational marijuana use. Then in 2012, Colorado uh, and the state of Washington began the trend of allowing recreational marijuana use. By 2018, just four years ago, there were nine states that allowed recreational marijuana use. Now, four years later, that number has doubled to 18, plus the District of Columbia. And in many of the other, most of the other states that remain, there is legislation pending where there are efforts to, to legalize recreational marijuana use. So again, there's little doubt that widespread legalization of recreational marijuana use is the future in the United States. It's just a question of how quickly the remaining states adopt recreational marijuana laws. And again, the reason for this is such a clear majority of the American people, as you saw from one of Amber's earlier slides, support the legalization of recreational use and a absolutely whopping 90 plus percent support the legalization of medical use. By the way, when we talk about the the legalization of marijuana, don't forget that doesn't allow employees who are in DOT covered positions, whether they be commercial drivers, whether they be pipeline workers, whether they be airline pilots, the DOT requirements that those employees abstain from marijuana use and be subject to drug testing have not changed. And if someone lives in a state where recreational and medical marijuana is perfectly lawful, They're still subject to DOT requirements, and they still can be fired from their jobs if they test positive on a DOT test. And no state 
can trump those federal DOT requirements. Let me turn things back to Amber to talk about how laws are changing with regard to employment protections for marijuana use in this country. Bob noted the many states that have legalized medical and or recreational marijuana, and those laws have resulted in various protections for employees and restrictions on employers. Let's start with medical marijuana. California was the first state to legalize medical marijuana in 1996. In the span of just over 25 years, nearly 80% of states have now legalized medical marijuana, with the 2021 additions of Alabama and Mississippi. These state laws take various and nuanced approaches to addressing the intersection of medical marijuana, use, and employment. Although we can't delve into each state's law here, let me give some examples of categories of legal protections and some of the states that have taken each approach. Some state laws, such as those in Alabama, Alaska, Georgia, Mississippi, North Dakota, and Idaho, include provisions that expressly state that employers are not required to accommodate medical marijuana use, albeit most of those statutes limit that restriction to not requiring accommodation of use while at work. Other states, for example, Louisiana, do not directly address employment considerations in the medical marijuana law at all, being silent on that issue. And some states, like Arkansas, Maine, Oklahoma, and West Virginia, their laws include non-discrimination provisions, which prohibit discrimination either because of an employee's status as a medical marijuana cardholder or because of a positive test resulting from medical marijuana use. To complicate matters farther, Kate's authority in many states, such as Massachusetts and New Hampshire, has provided for an employee entitlement to accommodation of medical marijuana use as a matter of state disability discrimination law. As you can see, employment protections for medical marijuana users can be complicated, fact-specific, and may implicate other state employment laws. Also, these laws continue to develop as more states legalize medical marijuana, with newer laws frequently providing greater protection for employees than, say, California or Colorado's earlier laws. But one fascinating development we are seeing, and this is really occurring over the past five years or so, is protections for marijuana use regardless of the purpose for use. Let's begin with prohibitions on pre-employment marijuana testing, either altogether or a prohibition on using the results of a positive test for marijuana. Again, these laws apply regardless of whether the prospective employee is a medical marijuana cardholder. We identify a few examples on the slide, such as Nevada, which was effective January 1 of 2020, prohibiting employers from refusing to hire a prospective employee because he or she tested positive for marijuana, unless applying for certain types of positions, such as firefighters, EMT, DOT-covered positions, or a position that, quote, in the determination of the employer, could adversely affect the safety of others, end quote. The Nevada law farther provides that employees who are tested within 30 days of beginning employment have the right to submit to an additional test to rebut the results of an, of an initial test. New York City, effective May 10th of 2020, prohibits testing prospective employees for THC as a condition of employment, except for positions such as law enforcement, child care, positions that require a commercial driver's license, or positions that a municipal agency has determined will result in a danger to employees or the public. Similarly, the City of Philadelphia Ordinance, effective January 1 of this year, prohibits marijuana testing as a condition of employment with similar exceptions to New York. While each of these provisions allows testing in situations where the employee could significantly impact the health or safety of other employees or members of the public, it remains to be seen what positions New York City and Philadelphia were determined fit in that category. It also remains to be seen what limitations the Nevada law will provide on the employer's ability to determine which positions are safety-sensitive 
and therefore require pre-employment marijuana testing. These examples provide specific prohibitions on pre-employment testing for marijuana, but applicants are also protected by rapidly expanding laws protecting employee recreational marijuana use under lawful use statutes. On this and the next slide, we will review six examples of state laws protecting recreational use of marijuana. Bob and I cannot emphasize how significant of a change this is in the legal landscape for employers in these states that have previously tested for marijuana. I also encourage you to consider the language differences between these statutes as we review them, which may present interesting future legal questions. Let's start with New York. New York's law was effective March 31st, 2021. It prohibits employers from refusing to hire, employ, or license, discharging or otherwise discriminating against an individual who engages in legal recreational activities, specifically including cannabis use, prior to the beginning or after the conclusion of work hours and off of the employer's premises. New Jersey, its law was effective February 22 of 2021, similarly prohibits employers from refusing to hire, discharging, or taking an adverse employment action against any employee because that person does or does not smoke, vape, aerosolize, or otherwise use cannabis items. Illinois law, effective in June of 2019, prohibits, including a reference to cannabis, refusing to hire, discharging, or, quote, otherwise disadvantaging any individual because the individual uses lawful products off the premises of the employer during non-working and non-call hours. Notably, while this law preceded legalization of recreational marijuana in Illinois, the law legalizing recreational marijuana expressly amended this lawful activity statute to protect off-duty recreational marijuana use. While all of these statutes are new, two of the newest include Montana, effective just three months ago, which prohibits with an express reference to marijuana, refusing to employ or discriminating against an individual who legally uses a lawful product off the employer's premises during non-working hours. Connecticut's law, which will take effect this summer in July, prohibits discharge or other adverse employment action against an employee because the employee does or does not smoke, vape, aerosolize, or otherwise use cannabis products outside of the workplace. Nevada's statute, which is one interesting effect of the Illinois law I mentioned, their lawful activity statute was passed in the 90s. It prohibits employers from refusing to hire discharging or otherwise discriminating against employees who engage in the lawful use of any product away from the employer's premises and during non-working hours, provided the use does not adversely affect the employee's ability to perform his or her job or the safety of other employees. The reason I reference Illinois here is that this lawful use statute in Nevada was in effect, like Illinois, prior to the legalization of recreational marijuana in the state. But the recreational marijuana legalization law there did not amend the lawful activity statute, resulting in a lack of clarity on whether this Nevada law applies to recreational marijuana use because of the continuing federal prohibitions on marijuana. You've seen a big move here in just the last three to five years in terms of uh, legalizing recreational marijuana use. There is real momentum towards passing bills imposing employment protections for off-duty marijuana users, but not every state is jumping on board. For example, just last month, Colorado legislators rejected a bill that would restrict employer ability to terminate employees for positive drug tests. This followed a hearing in which industry representatives in industries such as aviation, mining, and restaurants expressed concerns about potentially impaired workers in a variety of work situations, such as use of heavy equipment, kitchen knives, and hot cooking oil. As another approach, some states also limit the employer ability to test for marijuana or use test results for employees. 
Here's some examples from laws that we have just discussed. New York law provides that employers may terminate an employee for articulable symptoms of impairment by marijuana while at work. But here's the limitation on testing or use of test results. Drug test results cannot serve as the basis for concluding the employee was impaired while at work. New York State Department of Labor guidance adds that the smell of cannabis on its own is not evidence of articulable symptoms of impairment. That guidance provides that, and I'll quote from the guidance here, only symptoms that provide objectively observable indications that the employee's performance of the essential duties or tasks of their position are decreased or lessened may be cited as symptoms of impairment. That's extremely limiting. In New Jersey, employers are prohibited from taking adverse employment actions solely due to the presence of cannabinoid metabolites in the employee's bodily fluid. Like New York, a positive test alone doesn't show impairment and may not be used to terminate an employee. Testing, however, may be used and positive test revolts may be acted on if there's a reasonable suspicion of employee use of cannabis items while performing work duties, upon finding observable signs of intoxication related to use of cannabis items, or following a work-related accident subject to investigation by the employer. So we're seeing here positive marijuana test results without more cannot be used in these states. In Connecticut, as another example, positive drug tests for applicants or employees cannot be the sole basis for refusal to employ or to continue to employ or otherwise penalize an individual. However, results may be used in situations when the employer reasonably suspects an employee's use of cannabis while engaged in the performance of work responsibilities, so use at work, or the employee manifests specific articulable symptoms of drug impairment while working that decrease or lessen the employee's performance of the duties or tasks. These examples demonstrate, potentially, where state laws are headed with respect to employee marijuana testing limitations. But I also want to share with you a significant outlier in workplace drug testing. San Francisco prohibits all employment drug testing unless three criteria are met. You have to meet all three. First, there are reasonable grounds to believe the employee is impaired on the job. And that impairment presents a clear and present danger to the physical safety of the employee, another employee, or the public. And the employer provides at the employer's expense the opportunity to have the sample tested or evaluated at a state-licensed independent laboratory, and the employee is provided a reasonable opportunity to rebut and explain the results. In San Francisco, there will be no company-wide or random drug testing. So just an outlier example for you there. With that, I want to transition past issues of testing and restrictions on the use of test results to a really interesting area, in, in my belief, of these laws that will affect employers. This area is how many states' marijuana laws addressed past and current arrests and convictions. You may be aware that California has a law prohibiting employers from considering certain marijuana convictions for employment purposes once two years have passed since the date of those convictions. A new approach with these state marijuana laws is to provide for expungement of arrests or convictions for certain marijuana offenses. New York, as an example, has taken a very strong approach to this issue by providing for automatic expungement of a broad range of marijuana-related offenses. Policy experts have suggested that requiring individuals to petition for expungement often does not assist the individuals who would most benefit by having their conviction expunged. So New York has taken the lead in the automatic expungement effort. While most other states have not taken as broad of an approach on an automatic basis as New York, as you can see from the slide, many, many states have legislated provisions providing for expungement of marijuana-related offenses. As a result, over time, employers who use criminal background checks as part of the hiring process in these states 
may no longer see marijuana offenses on those consumer reports. Offenses and convictions such as for possession of small amounts of marijuana or cannabis concentrate, possession of marijuana in a public place or in a restricted area, for example, on school grounds, and convictions for exceeding personal cultivation and home possession limits. So I want to conclude this discussion on convictions with a reminder that consideration of criminal history reports, particularly as to marijuana-related offenses, must be applied consistently by employers to avoid challenges under employment discrimination laws such as Title VII. As a result, when you're considering your approach to marijuana policies and drug testing, remember also to consider your analytical approach to employment decisions based on marijuana offenses that show up in consumer reports as part of your overall program to consider your approach related to marijuana. With that, let me turn it back to Bob for a discussion on OSHA. As safety and health lawyers, Amber and I always ask ourselves uh, when we talk about safety concerns, including those associated with illicit drug use, so what's OSHA's view of this matter? Well, you know, obviously, as responsible employers, you should all be concerned about the effects of illicit drug use, including marijuana use, on safety and health in your workplace. You all are familiar with the General Duty Clause of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 that requires employers, generally speaking, to maintain a safe workplace for their employees. As many of you know, OSHA has specific standards for many particular hazards in the workplace. Notably, OSHA has never adopted specific standards with regard to maintaining a drug-free workplace or drug testing, but the agency certainly encourages and has encouraged employers over the years to combat the impact of drug use in the workplace. For instance, in a 1998 interpretation letter, OSHA indicated, quote, OSHA strongly supports measures that contribute to a drug-free environment and reasonable programs of drug testing with a comprehensive workplace program for certain workplace environments, such as those involving safety-sensitive duties like operating machines. What is notable is since that 1998 interpretation letter, OSHA has been largely silent about the notion of drug testing and combating drugs. And I certainly think under the current administration, we should not expect OSHA to speak out against marijuana. But you still, as a practical matter, should be very concerned about the impact of THC on workplace safety and how that can lead to OSHA problems. Let me explain. There's no doubt, as Amber explained to you earlier, that THC impairs key functions associated with operating equipment, driving, and other safety-sensitive functions. And we know that many industrial accidents result from employee inattention or other employee mistakes. So there's no doubt that illicit drug use, including marijuana use, increases the risk of employee inattention and other mistakes. When there is, as you, I hope you know, when there is an employee death or an employee hospitalization or amputation or eye loss, you have to report that event to OSHA within an established period of time. And that often, not always, leads to an OSHA inspection of the workplace. So the more accidents you have, including accidents caused by illicit drug use, the more often you're going to have OSHA on site. I was struck by a 2016 story out of Denver where a 64-year-old aluminum plant worker named Rick Seimer allowed himself to be caught and dragged into a machine called an aluminum splitter machine, and it killed him. After the incident, Mr. Seimer's Blood was tested, and he, and he had a significant level of THC in his blood. It was notable that OSHA came out and investigated thoroughly. And the area director of OSHA in Denver made the point, look, we are going to check to see if proper guards were in place, whether all the protections were in place that needed to be in place. And the fact that Mr. Seimer had THC in his bloodstream will not be any kind of defense for the employer. So please note that OSHA is important with regard to the marijuana issue because if you have employees impaired by marijuana, you're going to have more industrial accidents and you're more likely to have OSHA in your workplace. Let me turn things back 
to uh, Amber at this point to talk about other civil liability concerns associated with marijuana use. As Bob's noted, and and we've talked about so far in this webinar, there's a real tension between increasing employee protections and employer restrictions related to marijuana and potential liability for employers who have either lax enforcement rules and practices or cannot actively test for marijuana use. Employers can be subject to various legal claims by employees, contractors, visitors, or the public based on employee marijuana use. Primarily, accidents resulting from marijuana use could result in personal injury claims. Often, workplace accidents cause injuries to non-employees as well, such as contractors, visitors, and the public, which open employers to significant personal injury claims. Notably, this includes driving accidents while performing company duties or driving company vehicles. Farther, as Bob noted, in the difficult situation of an employee fatality, employers must report the fatality to OSHA, likely prompting an OSHA investigation. But in addition to that, in the case of an employee fatality, in states like Texas, if there's a finding of gross negligence related to an employee death, the workers' compensation exclusivity bar may not apply, opening the employer to punitive damages. Civil claims can also be made related to loss or damage of property, for example, contractor equipment, or negligence, such as negligent retention, particularly if the employer knew or should have known of an employee's marijuana use and didn't take corrective action, or the employer has a drug and alcohol policy or testing program that it's not consistently implementing and enforcing. Also, remember that insurance policies may have exclusions for claims arising from employee marijuana use. But litigation is not the only cost for employers related to employee marijuana use. Other than OSHA citations and civil liability, employee marijuana use can result in various additional costs, both time and expense for employers. Wide variety of examples here, such as decreased productivity, increased absenteeism, increased turnover requiring recruitment, onboarding, and training of replacement employees, increases in workers' compensation claims, issues related to employee morale, employee misconduct, time and resources dedicated to investigation of near misses, accidents, incidents, reasonable suspicion testing, and other similar circumstances, loss or destruction of equipment, and potential public relations consequences based on workplace incidences, incidents, or employee behavior outside of work. As a result, employee marijuana use can be costly, even absent injury or litigation. I want to transition back to Bob at this point to discuss some exceptions to employer limitations for employees in safety-sensitive positions. Thank you, Amber. As Amber pointed out, New York and a very small number of states are creating employment protections for off-duty marijuana use that have no exemptions from those protections for safety-sensitive jobs. A variety of other states, however, more conservative states, have exempted, for example, from employment protections for medical marijuana users, certain safety-sensitive jobs based on the notion that the safety concern in balancing interests should outweigh the right of someone to use medical marijuana. Those states with safety-sensitive exemptions from medical marijuana employment protections include, for example, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Pennsylvania. One of the practical problems for employers making use of these exemptions, however, is the test for what is an exempt safety-sensitive position varies widely from state to state. So you could hold have someone holding job position A, who could be treated as exempt from the medical marijuana protection in Oklahoma, who might not, in someone holding the same job with your company in Pennsylvania, may not fall within the narrower safety-sensitive exemption in that state. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these exemptions. The next five or so slides, I go through in detail the tests in, for example, New Mexico, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Pennsylvania, you're all going to get a copy of this slide uh, after our presentation, sometime after our presentation today, and you can read those slides 
at, at your leisure. But my point here, you see Oklahoma. Oklahoma has a very broad safety sensitive exemption. It includes any job that includes tasks or duties that the employer reasonably believes could affect the safety and health of the employee performing the tasks or others. And, and then it provides a very long illustrative list of jobs that might be included in this very broad exemption. So the employer, presumably, as long as they exercise good faith, gets to s- decide what safety sensitive is. And for example, you can see it includes, in the, if you look at the second sub bullet point, you c- includes anyone who operates a motor vehicle. So the Oklahoma test is very, very broad. If we can go to the next state, which is Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania has a very different and odd safety sensitive exemption. For example, it talks about the fact that people are not protected who work at heights or in confined spaces. And it talks about uh, the fact that uh, it talks about employees who perform life threatening uh, functions if the employee is under the influence of medical marijuana. Further, it indicates that a patient may be prohibited by an employer from performing any duty that could result in a public health or safety risk while under the influence of medical marijuana. So what does that mean? For example, if the employee uses medical marijuana at home at the end of their last shift and they show up and they are in no sense under the influence of medical marijuana, can they be excluded from that position? The Pennsylvania law is really awful in a variety of ways, was very poorly drafted. And these exemptions are one example. And again, they have this exemption that's based upon nanograms of active THC in, in your blood. Uh, <laughs> with the, the only problem is there's no way for employers to reasonably use this exemption because how are you supposed to measure nanograms? And you know, you're not going to be taking blood tests of your employees. So it's just the Pennsylvania exemptions are really a mess and they're far narrower than, for example, the Oklahoma exemptions. New Mexico has something more traditional in terms of a safety sensitive exemption to their medical marijuana protection. It includes a position in which performance by a person under the influence of drugs or alcohol would constitute an immediate or direct threat of injury or death to that person or another. New Mexico did a much better job of coming up with a succinct and reasonable exemption as opposed to Pennsylvania. And Arkansas, again, has a relatively broad test for what is a safety sensitive position more akin to what we have in Oklahoma, but perhaps not quite as broad as, as, this, as the state of Oklahoma has done. And again, Arkansas, like Oklahoma, has a laundry list of illustrative positions that uh, fall within the safety sensitive exemption. And there you go. And Again, you'll get these slides. So if you want to read about the Arkansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Pennsylvania exemptions, safety sensitive exemptions in greater detail, you'll have the opportunity to study those slides at your leisure. I'm going to turn things back to Amber now uh, to talk about this very critical issue. Okay, okay, practically, Bob and Amber, what do we do to deal with these problems? Amber? Yes. So let's discuss some strategies for managing safety concerns. First, I think it's very important to remember what we are not talking about, which is drugs other than marijuana. In a time where drugs such as cocaine, heroin, and opioids are also commonly abused, recognize that marijuana protections do not apply to those other drugs. As a result, employers should continue to maintain anti-drug programs and testing designed to address drug use and enhance workplace safety. Second, remember that state laws, with rare exception, do not protect employee on-premises or on-duty use, possession, or impairment. Employers should have and enforce policies that prohibit these activities, as well as supporting policies such as search and inspection policies to assist in enforcing those prohibitions. Third, Employers should ensure that managers are trained to recognize the signs of on-the-job impairment, to document their observations, and properly respond to impairment concerns. Remember that some states' laws, New York is a good example, narrow in on what constitutes observable impairment, and be sure your managers are trained on those laws. 
Bob, what other strategies would you recommend? Sure. A couple of things on this slide I want to touch on. One thing we tell clients when they're faced with a state where they don't have the, the leeway to apply marijuana prohibitions and like marijuana testing like they would to, like they would like to, is to focus on the behavior that created the concern. For example, often they're, they would like to test an employee because they've engaged in unsafe or otherwise unacceptable behavior. Well, remember, you can always discipline employees for unsafe behavior. If they engage in socially unacceptable behavior or violent behavior or angry behavior or disrespectful behavior, you can discipline them over that behavior even if you're not in a position in that particular location to send them for a marijuana test. Uh, Also, as number five, the second item on the slide, as we discussed, don't forget for those of you and many energy clients, this is really important if you're in New Mexico or Oklahoma, they have safety sensitive exemptions for the employment protections uh, that exist for medical marijuana users. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a strategy that more and more companies are adopting for dealing with these difficulties created by uh, the changing landscape, both legally and in terms of use of marijuana. And this new approach is typified by what Amazon did. In June of 2021, Amazon ended all marijuana testing except where required by the DOT. They did it for two reasons. One that they talk about in this quote, of course, is what we've talked about today, which is the changing state-by-state landscape was making it next to impossible for them to maintain a 50-state marijuana testing program. Moreover, as many of you know, their, frankly, their bigger problem was, and you heard Amber talk about the very high positive rates on drug testing for marijuana in recent years, they were having a terrible time filling warehouse and other positions because so many applicants were testing positive for marijuana. So they changed course and ended all marijuana testing except where the DOT requires otherwise. Dave Clark, who runs their retail operations at Amazon, offered the following quote in June 2021. Quote, in the past, like many employers, we've disqualified people from working at Amazon if they tested positive for marijuana use. However, given where state laws are moving across the U.S., we've changed course. We will no longer include marijuana in our comprehensive drug screening program for any positions not regulated by the Department of Transportation and will instead treat it, that is marijuana, the same way as alcohol use, close quote. So there's no doubt that more companies will follow Amazon's lead and end or at least substantially curtail drug testing for marijuana. For many of our clients, like energy clients, uh, healthcare clients, perhaps manufacturing clients, that's just not an option. The safety-sensitive concerns are such that they, they will continue to pursue marijuana testing where they can and to the extent they can. But some companies will follow Amazon lead and curtail or end marijuana testing as a strategy to deal with the difficulties we discussed today. I hope you found our presentation helpful. Again, uh, this is a very, very important topic. Submit any questions you want to us in the chat box and we'll get back to you. Thank you again and have a great day.